Hello, everyone. I, we will get started at the top of the hour, just letting people uh, continue to log in. So we'll be back momentarily. Thank you. Hello, uh, we will get started momentarily. People are still logging in and um, we'll get started in another minute or so. Thank you. All right. Um, Let's get started. Um, the looks like the number of participants has slowed down. So let's get started. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy Graham uh, to do introductions and uh, lead off the program. Thank you for attending today. Good morning. Oh, it's good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fourth annual Critical Access Hospital Virtual Call Conference. And I just want to welcome you to it. Just some housekeeping rules or housekeeping information up front that you are automatically muted when you came into the line. So if you'd like to ask a question, there's a chat box as well as a Q&A. You might need to click the little more button to get to the Q&A section. Feel free to enter any information in there, any questions that you may have. As you noticed when you joined, this session is being recorded. So the recording as well as the slide deck is going to be shared with all of the participants. And then at the very end of this conference or at, when you sign out of the conference, there is going to be a short survey that we would just ask that you complete for us so that we can get your feedback and um, just, you know, understand and make sure that we are providing content that is valuable to you. A little bit about Stroudwater, that Stroudwater has um, been in the rural healthcare market since 1985. And during that time frame, we've uh, serviced multiple clients, multiple rural clients throughout the United States. And you can see since 2017, here is a um, just a selection of our clients that are out there. So we are in all 50 states as well as Alaska and Hawaii. And really just be, enjoy being able to support the activities that are taking place in, in your communities. And then also we have a, a sister company, Straw Water Capital Partners. They, are, they work with USDA to provide capital funding for projects that you may have out there. And you can see that we've had several projects. They're not in all 50 states yet, but several projects that are out there um, with that. And a little bit more about Stroudwater. 
that we really want to help you navigate your community you know, today's existing healthcare environment. And we do that through strategic advisory services as well as operational services that we can perform support or provide support to you and your organization. And you can see a little bit about the activities there. My name is Amy Graham again, and I'm a principal with Stroudwater and I'm here with my colleague Ryan. And today we're going to be talking about mastering revenue cycles, you know, KPIs and what that's about. And one of the things that we realized in talking to everyone is that these strategies that we give you for revenue cycle KPIs can also be used in both the operational as well as clinical areas and just looking at the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan and have him just walk through the objectives and where we are headed. Okay, thank you, Amy. So like Amy said, today we're going to talk through some strategies around KPI usage within Revenue Cycle. You know, also how you can begin to implement KPIs into your standard workflows if you have nothing in place. Um, or, you know, if you're just looking to bolster your current understanding and usage of them. So our objectives today will include starting with defining what a KPI is and how they are used. Then we will discuss how to develop KPIs if you're starting from scratch. Then we will we'll provide some examples and formulas around critical KPIs within revenue cycle. And then finally, we will look at some of the best practices around KPIs. So with that in mind, we will start with the basics. You know, exactly what is a KPI and how they are used. So when we, we think about KPIs, what we're talking about is really you know, creating some of those quick and easy metrics and tools that help guide decision-making. Um, the chart here is a very high level of the overall claim lifecycle, you know, including some of those pre-claim activities on the left and some of those supporting functions on the far right side as well as the bottom. Um, that analytics peer, pillar you see on, on that far right is kind of where those KPIs reside, but, but as you see, as you'll see when we kind of go through this process, you know, th those KPIs and data usage will be prevalent throughout the entirety of your revenue cycle. Um, and as we walk through some of these next slides, uh, you can see that your KPIs will become, you know, a piece of your month closing process and provide a lot of metrics for overall, you know, evaluation of your team. So what is a KPI? A, a KPI is a key performance indicator a measure of a specific item or objective over time. It helps to measure financial health, stability, and trajectory, and gives value for further decision making. You know, when we think of what would characterize a good KPI, we use terms like actionable, directional, accurate, and measurable. So, you know, as we think about this without getting too elementary here, your, your KPI should really meet the criteria of all three words within, within KPI. They should be key meaning they are tied to something important that, that is worth paying attention to. They should be performance related, meaning they help you understand how well some activity or activities are going, or you know they focus on some aspect that you at least have some influence over. And then finally, they should be an indicator, you know, something that you can measure that actually matters to you within a revenue cycle. You know, is this item functioning good or bad? Is it improving or is it regressing? Um, We'll get into some examples here shortly, but but you know this real over high high level overview really just kind of sets the stage that you know KPIs help to begin explain the health within um, your organization of a particular function. So uh, one other item or terminology that's that's pretty closely related to KPIs that you may hear fairly often is OKRs or objectives and key results. You know, in comparison to KPIs, OKRs are usually um, re-evaluated more frequently by an organization, and they change with that organization's overall objectives. OKRs tend to be more ambitious and maybe more aspirational and possibly more fluid over time. You know, OKRs are more directly associated with an organization's values or the current vision or maybe a response and change to attitudes. Um, in comparison, your KPIs are more of a top-down established criteria to measure ongoing performance either month to month or year to year, you know, period to period. You, your KPIs tend to evaluate functional items of your business and processes more so than OKRs. And, and generally speaking, you know, as you think about KPIs, different hospitals and revenue cycles likely will have different objectives and key results, but most should have at least somewhat similar KPIs, at least to an extent. So then we think of, you know, what is the purpose of this KPI? You know, first, they help in trending to success of a process to show improvement or regression. 
you know, your KPI gives you a, a quick look to determine, you know, how you are moving. If you're moving towards the goal, away from the goal, if you're showing improvement or not, you know, am I getting better? You know, second, like I just mentioned, KPIs help to establish a target that your team is striving for. You know, as we will see later, uh, best practices around KPIs include establishing a target for each metric that you have. So at least your team knows the standard they're trying to meet and exactly how close they are to reaching that goal. So again, building from that first, first idea there, yes, we may have improved slightly from last month, but are we, if, have we improved to the point that we are reaching that desired goal or target yet? Um, another purpose for KPIs includes helping leaders make informed decisions based on data. You know, this allows to be more objective in, in nature as opposed to subjective. Um, we jumped ahead there way to the end, Amy. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hit the wrong slide there. My apologies. No worries. So I, I'm like, I don't know what I clicked on to get me there. So let me come back to you. Yeah. So we're, there we are. Straight back to the sort <laughs> of work. So again, um, your KPIs help you to uh, make better decisions that are backed by data. And then the final bullet point there is that KPIs help to recognize process breakdowns or opportunities for improvement. Um, the, the example I keep using is I think back to the change healthcare situation earlier this year. You know. A good KPI in place around claim submission or acceptance rate, something along those lines, could have been your first indication that something had gone awry and that your claims were getting in the door. And even if you did have that or you didn't, maybe there was another KPI that you had that helped you, you know, quantify that issue from a financial perspective. So again, that KPI provides a benefit in recognizing that process breakdown and quantifying it as you move forward. So we've kind of talked about what a KPI is. So now we will discuss, you know, how to develop those revenue cycle KPIs if you have absolutely nothing in place. You know, when, when you start to you know, think about developing those KPIs, you, your first step really is to just spend some time defining exactly what metric you're wanting to monitor you know, and exactly how you intend to measure it. Um, you wanna be sure that as you report this KPI that you're developing going forward, you obtain and measure that data the same way each period. So the example we have here is around denial count. If you have nothing in place and you're starting to uh, think about, you know, I want to track denials on a monthly basis, you know, define exactly what you mean by denials. You know, what data piece are you pulling and will you be able to pull it the same way every month? Are you counting how many denied line items occurred or how many invoices were denied or how many denial codes were posted? You know, those three items produce very different totals. And it's important to pull the same number if you're going to compare month to month and that your numbers don't tell the wrong story or lead you to make improper decisions. You know, a, a big part of this process is, again, documenting, documenting how that data is obtained for that KPI. Is it pulled from a specific report or is it generated from a, a formula or calculation? And, and really, again, spend that extra time to document this process within your KPI reporting. You want to define that KPI so well that someone could come behind you and replicate that same number and metric themselves, because quite honestly, that, that very well may be the case next month or next year or at some point in the future. Um, and again, if you're starting from scratch, think about those first KPIs, maybe just select one to three of each area within revenue cycle. So again, start small, but try to encompass all those areas of concern within your, re your revenue cycle. You know, think about claim submission and your front end of your revenue cycle, and then as well as that back end denial management piece, insurance follow-up, and consider what metrics would be of value for you to measure in each of those areas. You, know, you wanna choose KPIs that align with your organizational goals and give you the best insight to your team's success. You know, your KPI should really track what matters to you and be detailed as, as possible to define exactly what success looks like in each of those areas. So again, if you're starting from, from scratch, you have no KPIs in place, how do you develop those first you know, one to three KPIs per area? You know, we will walk through that same example that we just mentioned on that last slide around denials. But again, the idea here is to starting with something is better than nothing, and then you can slowly build upon that, that KPI till it's actually the, the most valuable for you. Um, so what we have here is kind of four arbitrary levels this, the, described on this slide. You know, if you have nothing in place regards to KPIs around denials, maybe your first step, honestly, is to start counting a raw number of denials received every month. You know, maybe you're counting the total number of denied invoices each month, and that's your, your, your starting point for day one. And then after several months, you at least have developed a high level trend of denials occurring. Then what we can see here, level two, maybe you progress to a, a percentage so that you, you've kind of taken that volume variance out of the calculation. 
you know, well, maybe last month you had 5% of your, your claims denied, but now you're seeing 4%. You're moving in the right direction. So that's great. We, we've made some progress. Um, but even then, once we get to that, that percentage, we can continue to build upon that and move towards what we have here as levels three and four, where we see more actionable data and more detailed trends kind of beginning to emerge. Um, you know, level three, the number of, of monthly prior auth denials from a tick, um, that you see as a percentage. And then level four, you have a, a, a payer as a part of that as well. These can be great indicators of, of changes in policy or prior auth requirements, or that maybe your internal prior authorization process could have some holes. You know, you, you possibly could could progress through all four of these, these levels pretty quickly, um, but even starting slowly again is better than having nothing in place. And it may be that levels three and four are, are too much into the weeds for a high level leadership level, you know, KPI dashboard, but they do provide, you know, a great amount of detail um, and opportunities for your employees that are working that AR. You know, trending items like, like, like prior auth really helps them to focus their areas and identify those top areas of concern. So as we think about kind of the value of clean and consistent data within your KPIs, it, one, one of the biggest things is it really helps to establish a, a starting point for communication within your teams. You know, it, it gives you a metric or a point in time that you can refer back to when having conversations on, on decisions or changes in behaviors. Um, clean and consistent data also gives managers um, an understanding of the why behind actions. You know, again, if you begin to see a drop in cash collections, can you look back at your KPIs and determine why? Did you have an increase in denials or a decrease in the volume of claims coming through the door or maybe more claim acknowledgement rejections that aren't even getting accepted by the payer? You know, the first step to many of your solutions within revenue cycle is to often understand what the issue is. So similarly, you can use these, these KPIs to encourage your team or, or, or get buy-in from them. You know, if you are making any type of decisions on changing someone's workflow or their scope of work, it is beneficial to have that that KPI and that data behind you that supports those changes. You know, again, KPIs can help support your vision and provide understanding and then allow for, for faster course correction. You know, when that metric starts to deteriorate, you can quickly see it in black and white and make an informed decision. Again, going back to that example about the, the change healthcare, do you have it in black and white as to exactly what's occurring and when it began occurring? You know, often the, the faster you can identify these type of issues, the better off you'll be. And, and that kind of leads into the next slide, which is, um, it really goes into, you know, without consistent KPI data, your small problems really can kind of balloon into larger problems. Um, you know, the, the first example I think of on this slide is your car dashboard. You know, if that check engine light comes on, you probably want to at least take a look before something massive goes wrong. You know, that, that temperature gauge starts slowly creeping upwards. Maybe all you need to do is just add a little coolant before that engine overheats and becomes a, a bigger issue. So again, small things like maybe lack of team engagement or, or inconsistent data balloon into a larger issue if you can't recognize it quickly and address it. So use your KPIs to identify those issues before they grow into larger problems. Um, one of the things that comes to mind here is, is really to help those frontline employees recognize that connection between their work and the bottom line. Um, as employees work flows in on a daily basis, you know, after a while, they may become detached from the bigger picture and kind of think that their work is getting lost, lost in the weeds and, and often they become numb to the true importance and the impact of their daily work does have on revenue cycle and in the organization. So again, use those KPIs to be able to point back to an improvement in a certain area you know, that you improve from month to month or year to year that may have been the result of someone's actions and their team efforts. And that really helps to get that buy-in and that team engagement occurring. You know, when employees can, can connect the dots between their efforts and the success, that's when those lights really start going on, um, things start to happen, and, and those larger issues have a better chance of being avoided. So that leads right back into that next, next slide, Amy, that you know, when effective KPIs are present, you know, that's when the, the action happens or the magic happens. Um, I, I would really say here that the title should be that when effective KPIs are present and are embraced by the team, that's when actions happen. So um, you, know, you really need to get that team buy-in. Buy um, so, so think of what we have here is kind of a roadmap um, for your team to start bracing KPIs. When you have those KPIs in place and they're established and accepted, everyone has the same version of truth, the same roadmap to kind of refer back to. Everyone knows where you've been, where you're going, and what your goals are, quite honestly. Um, your successes, opportunities are very much more easy to see, and there's factual data available to be used to engage within the team or with other departments. 
Um, your KPIs are also a good way to make something that may be somewhat subjective into a more concrete black and white answer. You know, when everyone can you know accept and embrace those those KPIs, that those decision your decisions can become more supported and justified for a lot of the things you do. So again, following this roadmap really begins to create a environment of you know data driven analytical nature. And as you build upon that that um, data driven environment, um, the focus really then becomes on addressing problems and not on nitpicking data. Errors, if you have errors in your data or there's there's doubts about the accuracy of what you're presenting, that really hamstrings the potential success of, of that quote unquote data driven environment. But once you have that agreement that can be found by everyone, that's when you see those positive actions of that greater efficiency occur. And it kind of just gets that momentum going and that engagement really begins to emerge. So we, we've kind of talked through the benefits of the, the KPIs. Now we, we kind of walk into an example of a KPI dashboard. Um, this one here I'd say is it's very generic. Um, we've built it in Excel, but what it does have is a couple of the, cre the, the key critical items that you should see within a KPI dashboard. Um, number one, each of the KPIs is listed in that first column. Um, normally when I would create something like this, um, either in the comments or right next to it, I would have directly how that data was pulled. I mean, as specific as the billing manager pulls report X um, the second day after close and reports the total found at the bottom of this report. You know, really get into that nitty gritty and have it detailed as possible. You know, you want to document all those, I say news reporter questions from elementary school, you know, who pulls it, what's being pulled, when, why, how, on how you generate that, that KPI for your dashboard. Um, the second item you see within this dashboard is that each metric has a goal, like mentioned before. You know, we have a documented target that we are shooting for and striving for. Those goals may change over time, but you know at least where you're headed and everyone is aware of the same goal that's in mind. Um, your, your days in AR, for example, it currently may be at 100, and your current goal may be to get it to set, set to 80. You know, But once that's met, then you can reevaluate that goal and, and maybe you push that down to the industry standard around 45 or 50, something like that. Excuse me. And, and then the third item we see here, um, not a requirement, but really a nice to have kind of on your KPI dashboard is that color indicator, that red, yellow, green as to how we are doing. Are we meeting the expectation? Are we way off or are we just now approaching and getting pretty close to it? So again, once created, your KPI dashboard gives everyone an overall idea of success. Um, like the last bullet says here, though, like, what is put in this KPI dashboard should be agreed upon and, and really used to help determine where focus is put going forward. You know, it doesn't simplify the overall RCM process, but it does help to really summarize and highlight areas of success or potential areas of opportunity. So when we start to think about reports in place to monitor those RCM key indicators, uh, we're talking about those involved in the claim life cycle. So thinking back to that first slide that we had with all the different um, portions of the claim life cycle, you know, there are process measures that help to explain how the hospital or, or clinical AR process is performing. These are separate reporting measures from those you have in finance, such as the general ledger or the PL. But as you can see, they do have a significant impact on each other. And you see that these two area, the arrows are tied together. And really, although they're pointing in different directions, um, that they do have, a, again, an impact on each other, especially flowing from that claim life cycle into that general ledger. You know, so as you consider you know, what reports are you going to put into your, your KPI dashboard, you know, keep in mind those that correlate strongly to items within the general ledger or other financial metrics. You know, items like bad debt, write-offs, charity, you know, consider how you're tracking those within revenue cycle and what impact they, those may have to those financial reports. So uh, reports to monitor revenue cycle, financial health, these here are pre-claimed through front end. Um, you ask, can you consider implementing any of these? Again, know exactly how you pull this data and keep in mind that they do have an overall impact on your overall cash collections and, and to your bottom line. Um, items like point of service collections here. You know, really consider how much your patient's copay and deductibles have gone up over the past several years. You know, and if you have a good reporting mechanism in place to handle that, that growth and that burden. You know, beginning to trend these type of numbers here over the course of several months kind of starts to give you an indication of whether or not any changes in your process may need to occur. Similarly, on, on the next slide, Amy, we've got, um, you know, more slide, more reports that are, you're focused more on the transaction processing and AR management. So these are more of your 
back end of the revenue cycle process or kind of overall arching holistic view of your revenue cycle. And he's giving you an indication of how denial management's going or the overall success of revenue cycle health. Um, I think of days in AR is really one of your, your milestone KPIs to measure within revenue cycle. Um, and like I said, you set your goal, honestly see where you're at currently once you've, you've tracked that number for a few months, and then set a goal according to where you're at that makes sense for you to be able to be attained that within the next several months. You know, part of the intent of these KPIs is really showing trajectory. And unfortunately, some of these metrics are not easy to change in one month or two months, but it does at least show you where you're trending and give you a positive or negative kind of direction heading forward. Um, from a calculation perspective, these are more for your reference for once this presentation is distributed, but you know, just to be aware of some of how these um, metrics are calculated. And then just from a internal discussion perspective, make sure that you're all talking about the same thing when you mention something, you know, percent of unbilled receivables. Is everyone on the same page as to exactly what they're discussing when they mention that that metric and then we're all on the same page? Um, and also, you know, even though most of these do have a you know, quote unquote standard calculation, just be aware that there are some variations available. Um, days in AR is a good example. Primarily 90 days is used as kind of that rolling, that rolling time frame, but I've seen 60 days, 120 days, 180 days. So just be aware of that, that there is some you know, availability to, to uh, variation within some of those reporting and just be consistent once you choose how you're gonna calculate one of those metrics to, to stick to that going forward. Um, now we're back, now we're back to this slide. We're we're good. <laughs> we're good. So um, from a HFMA Map Key initiative, just so you're aware, um, HFMA has created this uh, Map Key initiative to assist in KPI um, indicators around revenue cycle. Um, there's there's metrics in five major category groups: so patient access, pre billing, claims, account resolution, and financial me measurement. And, and what it is is that Map terminology is a, a three letter ac acronym for measure, apply, and perform. So um, follow the link that we have provided here if you're interested. And it really gives you more information about you know, the standard and benchmarks around um, KPIs within those areas. Um, th th there's some opportunities within that, that um, key initiative for peer comparison, benchmarking, and some other items as well. Uh, as well. So just be aware of that, that that option is available through HFML. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Amy to cover some of the best practices around KPIs. You know, I think I must have been jumping ahead to, so that I could get this. <laughs> You're so excited. <laughs> so excited about these best practices. So with the best practices, one of the things that Ryan was talking about is that you want that engaged team. And the way that you get that engaged team is by holding revenue cycle team meetings to review the results. You really want to make sure that you are that you are creating an environment that's very data driven and it's open to improvement. You know, if you, it's always like we're fighting over the data that's there, that's not really going to get you anywhere. But when you agree upon the result or agree upon the data and you know what you are tracking and that you have items that are actionable that you can actually make, make efforts toward, then it really creates that engaged team and, and you have um, success with that. And then also benchmarking against industry standards, as well as internally, just to see your improvements and your trends over time. It could be that, you know, on that page that Ryan had the Excel document listed, we've listed out what we recommend as best practices within the rural market. If you look at the, the map keys out there with HFMA, they have best practices and targets for the entire industry. So in thinking about that, you look at it and see where your hospital stands. And it may be that the goal is to hit a 45 day standard and your gross day is outstanding. But when you look at your number, it's more around the 60, 65 number. And you think, okay, can we drive toward that? And for you, in your organization, you want to keep it at, say, let's set our goal at 50 and get from 65 to 50. And then once you get to that 50, then go against the industry benchmarks and trending the, the results that you all are seeing. 
other best practices that are out there, um, you know, Ryan mentioned the reporter questions, you know, the who, what, when, where, why. You really want to make sure that that is documented so that you show that employee X pulls metric Y from this report Z at this time and how often that is done. Because when you are pulling this information, some of that information cannot be replicated. And you want to make sure that it's pulled the same way. And how often is it pulled? Is it pulled on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, yearly, quarterly? You know, what is that cadence for pulling that report? Because when thinking about those reports, like unapplied cash, once the payment posters come in and they start posting that cash for the day, you really can't replicate what that unapplied cash was by pulling a report out of the system. And so by doing it at the same time, at the, with the same cadence and the same person, you will have information that you can track and stay on top of. Also, when looking at tracking this, tracking KPIs, you want to look at trends and anomalies. You want to make sure that you're comparing it against a current period versus a prior period, a current period versus the prior year, and then also the current period versus the prior year in. So when thinking about this, that if I were looking at this first chart and you see the line that says cash collections as a percent of net revenue, when looking at it, someone might say, oh, it's gone down 15%. But if I look, and that's just looking at July versus June of 2022. But if I were to look at July versus July, July of 2022 versus July of 2021, I can see that my cash collections have actually gone up. And then you can see when looking at it, December to July, that it's gone up even more. And so by looking at this and monitoring it, you can say, what was happening? Why did this occur? You know, what's going on? And it could be that you had an initiative where we were going to improve fronting collections and just asking for the cash. And you can see that that's happened. But one of the reasons it went down between June and July is that your patients have started to hit their deductible year. So it is going down, but it's still higher than it was last year, which is an achievement for your team. And also the things that you want to do are making sure that you're asking those questions. And when asking those questions, ask why three times, because you know what? The first answer isn't always the only answer to the situation. There are multiple factors that are in play. So you want to be like, why did our cash go down? Well, why did we change that? Well, why has that happened? You know, looking at that information. You also want to look at the information differently. Are there specific aging buckets that are increasing or decreasing? Is there a specific payer that stands out? And is this an annual trend? I will tell you, there are some states that are hitting their, year, their fiscal year in. And so the Medicaid payments may not be coming in as quickly because they're waiting until the beginning of the next fiscal year before that cash is released. And so is that something that occurs every year? And if so, okay, when does it come back in play that we should start to see that cash coming in? Also, another area, thing to think about when spotting trends and anomalies is don't just focus on the financial areas. It could be there was an operational change that has impacted the information that is coming through. So, you know, look at the entire process from those pre-claim activities before the patient ever arrives all the way through. You know, has there been a change in prior authorizations? Was there a change in staffing and the person who was pulling it? And what does that look like now? And what can you do to fix that? And then looking at, you know, Whole, taking these KPIs and really working with your outside vendors. You know, you don't just have to say, mm, I have an outside vendor that takes care of her revenue cycle. I don't need to pay attention to it. You really can use your KPIs to have success within that contract. You want to have it or implement regular vendor performance reviews, you know, make sure that there's a timeline for it, that they are delivering to you standard KPIs and what does that look like? And then also use the focus on that actionable data again, where you're looking at leakage points, where is it going, what's happening, and then holding the vendor accountable, accountable for metrics that you want them to achieve, that an industry benchmark is an industry benchmark and your vendor should be meeting that industry benchmark. 
and then also establishing points of contact and anticipated staff involvement. Because there are some activities that your revenue cycle team is doing that you can see, ooh, we've got a problem here, why is that? And because you need to have that involvement with the local staff. Other questions that you can use, other areas where you can use a KPI is within payer contracting. What does your payer contract look like? How to hold them accountable? I talk to many hospitals and they're like, we're a small hospital, 25 beds. They're not gonna listen to us. However, if you go in with some KPIs and say, Here's your denial reporting that Ryan was talking about before. Here's the total number of claims that are being denied. We need to fix this. Or medical necessity. How many times are claims being sent back and forth with medical necessity or prior authorization? Those KPI items can lead to the overall success of your payer. And it shows the financial health of your contract. And then the final way to look at this is to take your KPI information and look at it on a daily basis. When Ryan mentioned the change healthcare, I think back to change healthcare and all of a sudden it broke in the middle of February and you're like, what's going on? How do I know what my problem is? You can actually take your KPI information to develop a daily rate that says, how many claims should I be submitting on a daily basis? How many are accepted on a daily basis? What's the rejected amount? And by using those KPI trends and that KPI information, be able to say, here is the impact that this has had. Or when thinking about using it for staffing, what is that daily average that someone should be working? And can that be done in an eight hour day or not? Um, or you know, do you need to make some shifts around? So when thinking about that, those are several ways that you can use your KPI data just to monitor how the performance of your organization is doing. Now, I know Ryan and I have chatted for a bit about uh, some you know, challenges related to KPIs and wanted to open it up and see if any of you had any questions related to your KPI data. Anyone? Hey, Amy. Hey, Hillary. <laughs> um, so I've got a question from, from Brandy. Okay. Um, she, Brandy was asking, was um, so how do I know if I have the right KPIs in place or if I'm missing something critical? We always seem to find things that are falling through the cracks. So Ryan, you want to take this one? Yeah, I, I think the first place I would start to is, one is kind of go back and look at that overall claim life cycle, maybe use that slide that we presented early at the beginning and kind of walk through from start to finish, you know, from a registration perspective, walking through all of it and say, okay, how is that being done currently in my organization? What does our workflow look like? And how would I define success in each of those areas? And do I have anything in place that monitors it or defines that success? So for claim submission, you know, how are we doing claim submission for our hospital? How do I define success? Is it I need 90% of the claims to get there the first first pass, whatever that number is. And then I say, okay, do I have a KPI that measures that that I'm looking at on a monthly basis? And walk through that entire process from start to finish and say, okay, do I have something that measures and tells me if I'm doing well or not in that area for each area within that revenue cycle? All right. I did see something else pop through the chat. Do um, you mind sharing yep. your slides after the presentation? Yes. We definitely will. Um, I also have a question from Bill. Um, Bill was saying, we outsource most of our revenue cycle. How do KPIs differ in this situation than when revenue cycle's done in-house? So I can go ahead and take that one. One of the things when tracking it, your, your outsourced vendor, you were paying them to be best in class. And so I would hold them to the industry standards, just taking um, the information that, that's there that has been reported, making sure that they are presenting to you key indicators. And if they're not, pulling that information yourself and looking at it. Then going back to them and saying, here's how we need to improve our performance. And then if there are areas that are that have gaps in it, to make sure that there's that it's being addressed, not only in the performance, but maybe in the contract. They may come back to you and go, that wasn't included in our contract of support that we will do for you. And so then you can renegotiate and work with them to hold that, hold that inform, you know, to include that information in the contract. 
Yeah, you, you make a good point, Amy. I was going to mention the contract there as well, but you, you touched on that. I, I, I think the other point is, you know, the, the old adage is whatever, the, the, the squeaky wheel mm. gets the, not the cheese, the grease, whatever it is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, and, and honestly, you know, working with some of these vendors, you know, it, I don't say if you press your thumb in their back for about three to five months, they realize that this hospital, this client is not going to let me slip. And eventually you don't have to press anymore, but it's really setting that standard and that expectation from them that we're not going to let it slide. You know, that that $3,000 for them may not be a big deal. And that may be a small claim compared to some other hospitals, but to you, it's an enormous deal and that they should treat it just like it's your their AR just as well. So yeah, mm -hmm. again, just, just stick on top of them and make sure that they understand that you're not going away and that your, your AR is valuable to you. And I think, Ryan, you know, you bring up a good point on the, um, with that sticking, that $3,000 claim. They may have a write-off policy for all of the large organizations that they write off everything $3,000 less, yet for some of your organizations, that's 90% of your business. And so, yep. you know, you really want to make sure that they, under, you know, like looking at the write-offs and looking at the denials and saying, this is a big deal to us. This may not feel material to you, but it is material to us and adjust accordingly for that. Hillary, do you see any other questions coming through at this time? I don't see any other questions, Amy and Ryan. I think that we are all set. Thank you all very right. much for your presentation. Hey, thanks. We're going to now hand it over to uh, Julie and Shad. So I'm going to start stop sharing my screen. And Julie, Shad, are you out there? We are here. Pretty all good right, day, everybody. Good afternoon. Handing it over to you then. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Ryan. That was really um, informative, and I love a good dashboard, so I appreciate your discussion around the KPIs. Um, do you want to, yeah, there we go. Hopefully you all can see our slides. Wonderful. Um, I'm on the line with my colleague, Shad, and uh, we just wanted to tell you that we're really excited to be here and talk about the importance of practice role management. Um, Chad, did you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure, yeah. So I've uh, been in healthcare for about 28 years. Um, I started my career as a practice manager. So this is um, something that I'm very passionate about when it comes to how organizations really need to invest in uh, practice managers. Um, a lot of hospitals who have practices as part of the, their organization they focus more on the hospital side because the hospital is open 24 seven. But if you think about it, there are times that clinic managers are working 24 seven too. A, a, a physician may call in at um, 11 o'clock at night and say, I'm sick, I can't come in the next day. You have to reschedule all the patients. There's so many things that can go um, haywire with the practice. So we have to think about it from that standpoint and organizations really need to focus on how can we um, make our practice managers successful and how can we teach them? And um, one of the things that I always tell folks is that I really feel strongly that practice managers probably have one of the hardest jobs that is in healthcare. The reason why I say that is because not only do they have to deal with the patients that come in the door, I mean, you can see, you know, 100 patients a day in some clinics or more. Um, you also have to deal with our wonderful providers that yeah. um, you know may have a good day or a bad day, but then you also have to deal with hospital leadership. So you're dealing with all of these three um, components and their practice managers really have to juggle a lot. So this is a really important topic I feel for organizations. Thanks, Chad, I, and I agree. I, I'm a former hospital CFO at a rural hospital and. I, I often think that um, people don't realize how important the clinics are to the hospital overall. And I think it's becoming more and more important. And that's one of the things that we're gonna talk about today. So we just wanted to um, jump right in. So our objectives today for the presentation, which we would really like to be a discussion, feel free to type any questions in the chat box or um, Describe some of the most important traits of an effective practice manager, which I think that, you know, most of us have 
have heard what they are, but I think they're kind of evolving a bit. So we want to make sure that we talk about that. There's important selection criteria for consideration when you're hiring managers. And then there's what happens if the organization does not invest in or develop their practice managers to the, you know, to really uh, perform to the top of their, their development skills and how the clinic bottom line is, is impacted when practice leaders do or do not have some of this strong training and development and guidance that we're going to talk about today. All right, so we're just going to, um, the slide that we have up right now is uh, what we consider best practice when it comes to competencies and traits of what a practice manager um, probably should know. We know that um, all individuals are going to be stronger in some areas than others. So with that said, there's going to be times when the practice managers need some advice on how to handle different things. So from staffing, throughput, quality, leadership, compliance, all those things. Um, I will just kick it off really quickly and talk a little bit about staffing because we all know that in healthcare right now and in all industries, staffing is really difficult. Um, and if you have a good manager that is able to recruit and also an HR um, department can help with this as well. But Someone, a practice manager that is really good at interviewing, maybe orienting the, the, the new staff, training them appropriately, involving them in team building, that's really important. And I wanna show a slide really quickly from MGMA. <clears throat> what practice managers, um, what and what, what you'll see is this is a trend from 2020 to 2022, and MGMA is showing the turnover rates in different areas of a practice. So you'll see from a business ops, business operations, clinical staff, ancillary support. Um, really what this is showing is that, you know, as of since the pandemic, uh, there is a lot of turnover. And so what is happening is in between hiring these um, open positions, the practice manager a lot of times are gonna have to fill in and fill in these open slots. And that's going to really take them away from their day-to-day -day operations and really their strategy and helping the physicians and teammates to be successful. So this is really a difficult time for for uh, practice managers to really um, to, to really handle everything right now. Well, and I think it's also difficult to create, you know. Uh consistent processes and not always be training someone when you see that increase in turnover that Chad showed on the on the screen. It's, it, it is important because you try to really establish policies and procedures in, in the way that we need to do things. And when there's, when a good portion of your staff is new all the time, that becomes a challenge. So we also wanted to talk about um, clinic leaders and their ability to manage and prioritize these functions that we have on the screen on a daily basis. That can be a skill in itself. You know, some might call it juggling. Um, as clinic offices become more of a focus for value-based care and the ever-changing field of healthcare, which I'm sure you're all aware of, the management of these clinics becomes a critical piece of a successful medical practice. So I, I think you've all heard the term value-based care and, and all all of you leaders that might be on the line that are actually managing these practices are feeling the impact more than the hospital might be feeling it or, or most other healthcare settings. It's very unlikely to change. So it's important that hospitals and leaders and clinic leaders realize how having a strong leader that can get it all done and manage it well is really important to sustain these practices and to maximize the levels of growth and reimbursement going forward within the practice. You know, pro provider practice of provider practices, excuse me, have always been an important component of healthcare. But the perspective of change has focused has focused on primary care practices and how they're managing these items listed above. One of the reasons many providers have become hospital employees is because of the challenges that we're talking about and the ability to the ability to manage all of this and get it done and get paid for the work that you're doing. So the evolution of clinic reimbursement has really progressed over the last five to 10 years and changed many of our priorities. It used to be important to manage the daily clinic schedule and now managing the patient's health 
is also expected. So managing the patient's health includes numerous um, indicators on, on the clinical side, and many times the insurance company is managing that as well and pushing you. So it's also become um, a situation where the clinics, if they do not manage the patient's health overall, the insurance company will work to take over the care of that patient. And I don't think any of us want to see that happen. The clinics are struggling to manage the practice, manage the data that's being pushed to them from insurance companies, and the tasks associated with the data that it's asking them to do. And many, many of these insurance companies put a deadline on the data. If you do not do X, Y, and Z for our patient within, then the insurance company will do it. Um, and so coordinating that care and really managing that patient's health is, is a bit of a progression for us. And, and it, it doesn't become a substitute for primary care physicians, but we just need to really have regard for who's fighting for our business these days. Yeah, for sure. I agree with you, Julie, on all of that. I think just two highlights on this one with this slide before we move on. You know, you're talking about a ACOs and um, the, the quality component is listed there. Do managers know that, you know, we need to really do chart prep so that are we capturing mammograms, colonoscopies, all of these things that we should be doing? And so if, you know, organizations need to um, provide developmental programs for these managers that may or may not have ever done those, done, done those things before, but then also um, com compliance is a really big uh, concern with joint commission who could come in at any time if you're provider based and especially rural health clinics um, are also subject to audits. So those are really important topics that organizations really have to train managers on. So, you know, we wanted to talk about some of the foundational skills that that are important in the future of clinic management. And one of them, of course, is the personal drive to provide the best service and the best care and follow up to patients and providers. It's really a key component of, of, a, of a successful practice, but really to never accept anything less, you know, to set that example for the staff and providers and to be almost obsessive with follow through, always communicating with the team and always communicating with professionalism striving for better performance and solutions. You know, all of you that are on the webinar today, you took you took some time out of your day to learn and, and, and follow the industry. And I think that that's a really important part of, um, of personal drive and, and remaining interested in what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah, and having been in the trenches as a practice manager um, as well, you know, personal drive and pride and ownership you know, you come in every day as a practice manager, no day is ever the same. And I'm sure every person on this webinar could probably say the same thing. But a good practice manager needs to be able to um, adapt and then also be able to help their teammates and their, their co-workers adapt as well, because it's going to change all the time. There's going to be that angry patient. There's going to be that physician that's not happy with their schedule. There's going to be all of these things that you have to really adapt to on a daily basis. So again, these are soft skills that um, people can be taught. Some people, um, it can take them a little bit longer to get there, but these are some really good skills that um, a good manager should, should have. I think I think it's really important, you know, that that pride and ownership within the team and rec recognition for the office functions that are, you know, that are happening, bringing that team together so that they're all working towards the same goals for the patient. There's, it, it requires energy and confidence and um, the empowerment is a key component of that. So there, there are a lot of, while there are soft skills, there, there's quite a bit there on the screen to create a, a, an environment with pride and ownership for the clinic and considering the patient's perspective and the provider's perspective and the financial implications of decisions. And it just all adds up to a lot. It does, especially relationship building. Um, it's really important for practice managers to be able to develop a really close working relationship with their providers and their teammates. 
um, because you have to trust one another. If that trust is ever broken, um, it's really hard to get that back. So practice managers really need to come in, make sure that they're honest on a daily basis. They're, you know, they um, try not to sugarcoat things, but to say it in a political way, be professional, um, but really make sure that relationship is there with, with your team and your staff, because you don't want to turn over, you don't want to create a bad environment. Yeah, you sure don't. You sure don't. We have patients coming in and out of these offices all the time. So it's, it's really important. You know, the, the ability and the integrity to be open to personal growth and feedback. I think that that's really important. Um, when I was young, my boss had told me that my strongest skill was being um, accepting of feedback and taking it and doing something with it. So, you know, hearing those hard things that we really don't want to hear sometimes, but acting on them is a trait of true coachability. It's really an important leadership skill to want to continue to learn and grow within yourself. Yeah, for sure. And then as practice managers, we all um, problem solve on a daily basis, um, multiple times a day. And practice managers are usually fixers. They want to fix things that are not going well. They want to make sure the patients have a great experience. And so um, this is a good quality, but a lot of managers who may not have all of these skills um, learned um, or developed, a lot of times they'll say, well, we, you know, if there's an issue that pops up, they'll say, well, we've always done it this way, or um, the EMR can't perform it because it's just, the, the, it is the way it is. But a, a strong practice manager really is gonna have to be the problem solver and help your teammates to um, understand the whys behind things. Yeah. yeah, to be the one that gets that that EMR vendor to make the change that you need. I mean, that's it, it is challenging, you know. And I think uh, the confidence is really important when you think about these leaders and having strong the confidence to have strong communication skills and even to be creative in how you're going to communicate with your team because usually there you have patients in the clinic, so. Um, open communication can be challenging. You have to think of different, maybe a few different mechanisms to make sure that the entire office is informed and, and feel supported. Yeah, and another strong um, component for a practice manager is to you know huddle with your staff and providers um, on a regular basis. Listen to what they have to say. They are in the trenches day in and day out, and they're gonna be able to give you some advice on what would work better for the practice? So really um, being a good listener, not always be the first one to speak, but listen to what your teammates have to say. Quality is resilience. You know, sometimes all of the work to be done and all of the challenges that happen in healthcare can really uh, make people think that it, there's no way they can make a difference. So you have to keep fighting that fight and. Um, recognize fluid, how fluid situations can be and strive to understand, you know, the context and the clinic and, and recalibrate when things start to veer off course and regroup and get input from others. As Shad said, I think, you know, you, you need to punt and tackle. Sometimes you need to block and tackle. Sometimes you need to pass, just tackle, you know, keep going like the Energizer Bunny and, and never stop. Having that, that drive and resilience and energy is, is really important. You know, part of what we're saying is the most important goal of this leadership development is often the ability to change others' behavior and increase their skills and knowledge. In order for others to believe in it and, and carry it forward. Oh, look at there. We have some polling questions. So, um, we were hoping that you guys would give us some feedback as we're having this discussion today. That, um, Hillary, well, there, she put it on there. The question is, what level of formal leadership training exists for new and existing managers, directors, et cetera, in your organization? Um, informal on the job training, mentorship program, leadership classes, or none? So if you guys would be willing to answer the poll, that would be fabulous. We're really cleaning.
Are the votes coming in there, Hillary? Yep. Um, can you see it? You can't see it, Julie. It's no, we've can't. got about 60% participating so far, which is great. Thank you everyone for participating. And we've got um, would you like me to share some Please. results? Yeah. So um all right. And looks like responses have kind of stopped coming in. So uh we've got um 71% saying informal on the job training. And then the next is leadership classes at 46%, 25% said mentorship program, and 18% uh, said none. On the job training, that, that's very important. Um, we just also want to mention that I think sometimes you need some other um, legs to that stool, whether it be the leadership classes or the mentorship programs, to make sure that that a new manager or someone who really just has, you know, been doing the job for a long time and needs a little bit of, um, uh, it usually takes more than one approach. So thank you for answering the questions. We really appreciate your um, your involvement in that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So. Um, you know, we we realize that sometimes hiring and, and things in the rural markets can be a little bit diff different than it is in some of the bigger cities. So can we hire individuals who have strong clinical experience, but they, they might not have the personality or the qualifications to successfully manage people? Um, you know, they're often the taskmasters that are not always the strong leaders. Um, they do the tasks well, but they might not juggle the people well. And there are varied levels of knowledge and and uh, work to be accomplished. So it's important to consider the coachability and development potential of these candidates. How are they able to relate to their team and and their providers? And what makes them come to work every day? Are they, you know, can they handle an upset patient as well as they can handle an upset provider and upset staff? And um, really uh, create an environment of of standard work and moving forward. You know, because it, it doesn't include the ability to influence and guide others on the team. So the ability to relate and and to be comfortable with difficult conversations, with, which is definitely a learned skill. Um, these leaders need to be able to make a difference and lead the charge and, and to really have those conversations in a timely manner and, and make sure that they are influencing behavior. So screening candidates for their ability to, in, to embrace the importance personal drive and relatable skills that we've talked about it. I don't know. I, I know that Chad, you have some experience with this with this type of um, example that we're talking about. Yeah, I do. Real, a real quick story is that um, we had a rural practice that was uh, we built from scratch, brand new building, and we recruited providers. And um, we had a nurse that had been a long, long term nurse, um, wonderful clinician. And um, we and she was from that community, and we said, well, she's going to be a great practice manager because she's she knows that she'll she knows the community, she knows um, how uh, you know to be a clinician, she knows uh, she's worked in a practice before, and um, we thought this is going to be great. Well, from a clinical standpoint, she was phenomenal. Patients loved her, the providers loved her. Um, what we didn't do was set her up for success. So as an organization, we did not um, train her at the beginning on the business aspect of, of things. So on a daily basis, I would get six to eight calls from her daily, and she would be asking questions about, well, what about this report? What do I do with this? Or who do I send this to? And so that's going to be really important when you're choosing an individual that maybe maybe is within your organization, make sure you set them up for success at the very beginning. Maybe you don't put them in the trenches right away, but give them those tools in the toolbox to be able to, to, to do that. And we I learned that the hard way. So that's why I'm giving you also a little bit of, a, of a, uh, advice. True, we've all, we've all um, been through similar situations. So thank you, Chad. So our second polling question, if you would be willing to um, 
answer is historically, have you been satisfied with your clinic manager's ability to establish strong clinic operations? And of course, your choices are very much, somewhat, very little, or you're currently unsatisfied. So we have answers coming in, um, still coming in, so we'll wait a minute. Um, right now, somewhat is in the lead at 57%. Um, and let's see what else. Got 58% of folks, well, 60% of participants responding. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, engaging with us on this. It's really interesting and informative for us. Um, so somewhat is still standing out, 60% uh, of the votes. And next in line is very much at 20%, uh, mm -hmm. very little at 12%, and unsatisfied 8%. So we had those up against about 20% or below very much and somewhat. So, and, you know, it kind of begs the question as with the conversations that we're having, what what level of leadership do we need in these clinics going forward with some of the, the way that the industry is changing and forcing us to change? So thanks again for answering those. We really appreciate it. So... One thing that we wanted to bring up is what is the cost of doing nothing? What if organizations decided, you know, or couldn't um, or don't have a developmental department that can give your practice managers maybe a toolbox of ideas or things that that could help them be more successful? Obviously, the first item there is going to be there's going to be a lot of workflow inefficiencies for your for your practice. That's going to impact your um, patient um, satisfaction. It's going to impact your uh, provider satisfaction. So if you don't invest in these leaders, there, there's really going to be a lot of things that um, is going to fall through the cracks. And Julie, I know you're going to talk a little bit about that as well. Yes, you know, accountability. Um, it's, it's not a lot of people's favorite word, but I, I really like um, bringing some accountability into this. Individuals may feel that there's low or no accountability for themselves or their team. And when we talked about the, the rate of turnover that you're seeing in the clinics now post-COVID, some of that, you know, is a product of, well, why do I have to do that? And the other team member doesn't do it and those types of things. So we want to make sure that we have uh, a level of accountability and standards that we're treating everyone fairly and that, um, really the, the ownership of the team is demonstrated and how things get done can have such a strong impact on that turnover and, and the overall clinic performance. And also as a leader, holding ourselves accountable for, uh, make, for making progress, for making a difference, for um, and, uh, more difficult than others or gone on for a long time and finally getting them done. You know, I think efficiency matters more every day in our clinics and as change continues to happen every day. So we need to take seriously how the insurance companies and the drug stores work to attract our clinic patients to their environment. You know, they they have what some might consider a convenient and sometimes free of charge care setting. It's, you know, it's imperative that patients are able to rely on our strong clinical performance and efficiency during their visit and in our communication with them. So we maintain that loyalty that um, many patients have to their clinic practices and, and, you know, have spent years building with the provider. So we realize it may sound a little bit repetitive to some degree, but all of these things have become more imperative as time rolls on. You can improve and you can succeed with strong clinic leadership. It really has become important that we work to position our clinics for the future. You know, clinic managers have to have an approach for value-based changes that are happening now. And that's really part of stabilizing our primary care strategy going forward. Look at there, we have a circle. So the cost of doing nothing. This, we really felt that we needed to come to you all with some sort of dollar figure around. So, you know, I've been 
doing this in my clinics for quite some time and I'm doing all right, what is really the big difference? And, you know, the darker bars on this chart are the average cash collections for primary care physicians for MGMA at the 10th, the 25th, the median and the 75th and the 90th percentile. Lower performing practices collecting between 500 and 700,000 and high above a million dollars up to 1.6 million. So the difference in collections for a strong performing family practice clinic as compared to the average practice as it relates to efficiency and ability to collect on claims and importantly, the panel size ranges um, you know, that, that gain on collections ranges from $260,000 with larger potential to get the average strong practice operations at, to a significant increase of over $800,000. So there, there's potential for most clinics to continue to improve and to really have that impact the bottom line. Um, you know, one some of the examples of the way that we can improve on those collections and really make a difference is to increase patient volumes, to improve clinic and so we get paid more for value-based care, to improve patient registration errors or prior authorization processes, and all of decreasing staff turnover as we've talked about. So the list goes on and on of ways that strong clinic leaders can impact the bottom line. You know, review the metrics with your clinic manager and see what they track monthly to understand your opportunities. And, you know, let us know if that's something that you'd like to discuss offline, because we love to talk about these things, as you might have noticed. So, um, we're talking a little bit more about the cost of doing nothing. You know, does your clinic manager have financial accountability for improving patient outcomes? I mean, wow, there. That is uh, a really a newer statement in healthcare, I think, when it comes to leadership performance and what value-based care is, is molding both care delivery and care payment by rewarding providers for getting and keeping people healthy. So I think it's important that we think about that the primary care model is one of the great ways rural health can impact their own community health. from fee-for-service models to payment based on the value of the care delivered. I was reading an article the other day, and uh, the Humana Medicare Advantage plans are now 70% value-based, and you can rest assured that Humana has a goal to raise that higher. You know, how do we help patients get better while keeping our costs down? It's a challenge that's here to stay, more in the clinics than, than a lot of other settings in healthcare. Yeah, these clinics are a key access point for our hospital as an organization. So we just wanted to make sure that we all have regard for that. What do you think, Chad? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think that um, obviously um, outpatient clinics is going to be a good solution for lower costs of care, but it's also going to be um, important that if it's an OB practice, for instance, you know, are you tracking the number of um, ultrasounds that you're doing? Or then if you do have x-ray, are you doing Are you um, having too many x-rays um, for per, per patient? And so there's all of these things that you have to take into account, but um, the outpatient component or ambulatory is gonna be the cheaper model um, now and in the future. Yeah, it really is. You know, CMS has taken our leadership role in testing several programs, such as accountable care organizations, like Chad mentioned, and other types of value-based care models. And, you know, these earned financial rewards for taking responsibility for caring for a defined group of patients and improving their care, largely through better coordination of services and, and well-documented improvements in their overall health. So insurance companies would love to tell your patients where to have their MRI and their lab tests and their colonoscopies based on the cost data that they collect. And that's really part of the reason that we bring up the cost component. That in, um, I, I think that patients are more aware of the cost component as well. CMS is also testing um, episode-based payment system, which includes one payment for all the services that you would typically need under one type of a medical issue. That, that one hasn't taken off quite as much as value-based care um, in, in, in the um, 
private practices or in the hospital owned practices. So results have been and been mixed overall and as far as some of the value-based care, but there is quite a bit of the value-based care, maybe even more than we might realize in our own practices. So CMS has a goal that all Medicare beneficiaries, me, sorry, excuse me, all Medicare beneficiaries and most Medicaid beneficiaries will be enrolled in an accountable care um, program by 2030. And 2030 is coming along faster than I realized. So interest in participation in value-based care in the commercial sector just keeps increasing beyond what Medicare and Medicaid are looking at. So encouraging participation overall and making sure that we're you know, really embracing these models in the, both the public and private sector to make sure that we're being accessible and cost efficient in our, in our practice. You know, the term accessible is where a lot of the healthcare disruptors manage our markets well. Amazon Health provides a mobile app that enables 24 seven virtual care, primary care visits, including on demand. And Amazon Clinic includes an upfront price, no insurance needed, no billing hassles. They quickly treat common conditions any time of the day. And these insurance companies are, are trying to do some of the same. So are your clinics measuring patient access? If a patient calls in and, and um, really feels that they need to be seen, can you get them in? If they're a new patient and they need a new patient evaluation, how far out do you have to book them? And um, you know, how prepared are we to compete with these, um, these disruptors in healthcare to make sure that we are retaining our patient base? Yeah, for sure. I know, Julie, we're getting close closer to time, um, but I think overall, I think um, your what you're talking about is really good. I think organizations have to decide um, who in their organization really has the thumb on the pulse of value-based yeah. payments. Um, this is going to be really important, and you need to educate your practice managers on why is this important and, and, why, and the whys and the hows and how can you get through the value-based care component. Polling question, and this is the last one because we want to be, um, we want to have regard for your time today. So to survive, do clinic providers need to begin the transition from providing health care to ensuring health? Um, it's so, so interesting. Yeah. I'm you're, just, you're seeing these results, right, Julie? I'm seeing it this time, Hillary. Thank you. Great. Um, oh, thank you. So it looks like 60-40, um, yes and somewhat, but I'm thankful that no one said no. Um, you know, because one of our goals today was to make sure that we are all talking. Now it's going a little bit closer to 50-50 at the end. So I, I realize that um, some of us are not feeling this as much as we might be talking about, but I think that it's it's not too far down the road. So thank you for answering the questions. We appreciate that. All right. So um, basically, Julie's been uh, talking a lot about um, the financial component and, and what really is going to happen over the next 10 years. We are really going to have to manage health, try to keep people well, if we can at all possible, manage those uh, chronic diseases, keep them out of the hospital. So that's really going to be important. As everybody knows, you're reading that on a daily basis uh, from Becker's or you're getting it from MGMA or HFMA. Um, and then what, I, what I've learned being a practice manager is if organizations can provide practice managers with the right reporting, you can be successful in all of these items. So if you know how many um, patients need their mammogram or how many patients need their colonoscopies, you really need to be able to, as those patients are coming in for their visits, make sure that you get them scheduled for, the, for those procedures. Um, that's when you're going to be able to capture this and be successful with, uh, with what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I completely agree, Chad. I, I appreciate that. So um, we want to make sure that we wrap this up with, a, with time for any questions that you might have. Um, I think we've covered the majority of the benefits of developing your clinic leaders. 
Uh, so if there are any questions, if you would like to either um, raise your hand or type them in the chat box, we would love to. And, um, you know, we, we find it such an interesting topic and sometimes think that some of these clinic managers just need to have some of these conversations to keep this going. So uh, if, if you look at the slide that Shad has displayed right now, you have our contact information for both Shad and I. Feel free to drop us an email or give us a call if you want to discuss um, any of this, since, since we obviously like to, like to take the opportunity to thank you for joining us today. Like I said, that's the leadership skill in itself. And we'd also like to introduce um, our next presenters, who are two of my favorite people. I watched their presentation um, last week, and we think that you will enjoy what they have to share today. So Wade Gallen is our senior consultant in the finance division at Stroudwater. And, uh, Am. And Blaine is, um, she works with Cost Reports Daily for a multi-hospital system, and she's really a pleasure to listen to as well. So I will hand it over to you, Wade. Fantastic. Thank you, Julie, for that introduction, and thank you for that engaging presentation. I really appreciated that. Um, looking forward to jumping into Cost Reports as we go into our last session of the day, um, and I hope that you all enjoy it as well. Um, just going to give a, a quick minute here, uh, just introducing how we're going to do the, the cost report session today um, while my colleague joins. We are going to be um, outlining a few, few areas, one of which being essentially an overview of critical access hospital reimbursement. So we can set the stage for why the cost report is important and the role it plays in setting our cost-based rates. The next section of the presentation is going to go into a number of best practices that we have um, thought through. You know, Blaine and I have been uh, kicking around several ideas around this presentation and uh, looking at some of the best practices that we've experienced in our roles, uh, helping to prepare and review cost reports. And then the next section we're going to focus on is uh, common reimbursement opportunities. So. This comes from really a review of a number of Medicare cost reports uh, for hospitals, critical access hospitals all over the country. Um, we do a number of cost report reviews and as you start to look at them, there are some uh, common areas that, um, that we see and they're usually opportunities for additional uh, reimbursement for critical access hospitals, not always, but at times they are. And then also these reimbursement opportunities help us to be able to um, prepare a cost report more accurately, right? So this is a important document to understand and note. So we'll be touching on those um, reimbursement opportunities at the end of our presentation here. Um, for way of introduction, again, Wade Gallon, Senior Consultant here at Stroudwater. Um, I have been working in and around cost reports for uh, quite some time now. I started off at a Medicare administrative contractor and then moved my way into consulting where I was helping um, prepare cost reports and helping evaluate you know, audit adjustments for cost reports. Um, and I worked my way into a system that uh, is up here in Maine. That's actually where I met Blaine as we met in this uh, healthcare system as we were preparing many a cost reports and we went through a number of cost report seasons and month end closes. And you know, it, so we were definitely in the weeds um, on the grind together in that. And I'll let Blaine just give a quick introduction of herself. Yeah, um, I'm Blaine McKinney, and I'm currently a manager of reimbursement for a system in West Virginia, WVU Medicine. Um, like Wade said, um, we met at Maine Health when we were both employed there together. Um, and I was an analyst there, a senior analyst, and then a manager as well. Um, so my time has all been spent on the provider side. A lot, of, a lot of cost reports that I'd, I'd say Absolutely. You know between the two of how many cost reports have been prepared. So it's uh, it's good to have good to have you on board. So again, an overview of critical access hospital reimbursement at the highest level, you know, wh why is a Medicare cost report important? What role does it play? You know, as a critical access hospital, as many of you are well familiar with, you receive cost-based reimbursement for, at the very least, traditional Medicare 
For Medicare Advantage, the rates that are paid um, are supposed to be Medicare equivalent, and so you'll utilize rate letters to send to Medicare Advantage payers in order to get a rate that's comparable to Medicare, so the cost report impacts those rates. And then in some states, Medicaid as well is a uh, cost-based payer. And so, you know, cost-based reimbursement, it really helps in situations where we have very rapid changes in our volumes over time. So if you think about the, you know, annually, if we see significant declines or, or increases, we are going to, you know, see things like our per diems and our rates start to shift, but it'll be based on our allowable costs. And so it, in some ways, it's a bit of an insulator. It's not a, a hedge against all the risks associated with um, rising expenses. We've all realize significant inflation. So it's not going to protect us from all of that or negate the need for prudent cost management strategies, but it does serve as a partial insulation from some of those rapid fluctuations and also gives some advantages when we think about capital planning and um, meeting the needs of our community. So the Medicare cost report is really important to cost-based reimbursement because you will be paid according to what is filed on your cost report. Uh, that is what's going to be used to set rates going forward. And we will have a true up at the end of the year for Medicare, but you know the cost report really is an important document for, for getting our rates to the point that they are for our cost-based payers. And so as we jump into our best practices, we're just gonna go through six of them. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. I'm sure Blaine would agree there are so many other areas we could touch base on and even trying to cover this all in 40 minutes is a bit daunting, but we're going to do our best and, and we're going to try to tackle as many of these as we can. These are the ones that stood out the most when you're thinking at the highest level, what are the things to be mindful of? And while we're kind of going through, I would definitely encourage folks to type in the chat your experience with cost reports. You know, are you a, a seasoned cost report preparer? Have you never touched or reviewed a cost report? Do you utilize outside consultants to prepare your cost report and you take more of a review lens once it has been prepared, or, or maybe you have never seen a cost report before, definitely feel free to uh, put that in the chat so we can better understand our audience here. And um, that'll make it a, a bit more engaging too, as we learn about who, who's on the call. But going through, you know, we have our first best practice, which touches on the concept of uh, matching. So we got the matching principle that's applicable for our Medicare cost report. What this means is that we need to accurately uh, account for our expenses and our revenues. So the Medicare cost report has um, a delineation mechanism for our expenses and revenues called cost centers. So we divvy up all of our expenses and revenues into certain cost centers. And those are used uh, to calculate everything from your per diems, your Medicare to cost to charge ratios. Um, really important to be mindful of. And when we say matching, we mean you have to make sure your expenses are in the same cost center as your revenues. Sounds like it might be simple in theory, uh, but it's actually quite difficult, especially when you get to, uh, you know, and, and something that I found and, and Blaine might agree or maybe not, but on the revenue side, especially as we deal with more detailed files, um, it's not always as clear cut, you know, where the revenue is supposed to be. Um, but it's it's a potential issue because it has the it, it has the ability to impact your rates. You know, trying to match up expenses and revenues is not just a, um, you know, compliance exercise. It really does matter. And I know Blaine um, was sharing about a situation in which this this occurred not too long ago and the impact it had on, on the cost report. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my current system, most of our um, fiscal year ends are 1231. So uh, just not too long ago, we were uh, filing our cost reports for the May 31st deadline. And one of the facilities um, that we were looking into, we kept um, focusing back in on the cost to charge ratios between our EKG and our respiratory clinic. And after doing a little bit of digging, we realized that a lot of the EKG services were actually being um, performed in the respiratory clinic, but we had a mismatch of our Medicare PSNR allocations that weren't pushing enough uh, dollars down into that respiratory clinic line. Um, 
So we ended up moving about $400,000 and this was a huge um, move for their settlement and that actually flipped them from a liability into a receivable um, situation with their settlement. So it's very important to make sure you're not only matching up your total worksheet C dollars, but also your Medicare PSNR allocations. And are there differences from year to year there that you need to investigate? Um, definitely the thing that clued us in was cost to charge ratios and kind of focusing in on that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, I love how it shows a real life example of why this really matters. And I also love how you brought yep. up the Medicare PSNR. I do see that we have a, a few new folks to um, healthcare or to the Medicare cost report. And so just by way of explanation, when we reference the Medicare PSNR, this is a report, a provider statistical and reimbursement report that's provided by Medicare and outlines all of your Medicare days, discharges, charges um, by type. So it breaks down to inpatient and outpatient. It'll break out your RHCs if you have those. So it's a really important file to keep in mind. And Blaine is absolutely right. We need to make sure that we're matching um, the charges and information that's on the Medicare cost report as well to the appropriate cost center. So it makes a huge difference. Um, you know, what for best, best practice, we really want to focus on reviewing our mappings at least annually. Um, I, I personally am in favor of doing it a little bit more frequently than that, but I understand that it's not always a reality. Uh, but we want to just be understanding that um, why, why are we are we seeing cost to charge ratios at where they are? Why is our per diem where it is? And then using it as a tool to evaluate if there are any issues like Blaine mentioned. The next one we have is, is focused on our overhead cost allocations. So when we look at the cost report, as I mentioned, we have cost centers and within those cost centers are a number of expenses and revenues. What the cost report does is break out what they deem to be your overhead expenses and those go into a bucket of overhead cost centers, right? So we've got our housekeeping, we have our dietary, we've got our social services, we've got a number of other administrative departments that are in there. And the cost report basically takes all those expenses and it allocates them to a non-overhead cost center. So that could include you know, your outpatient departments, ancillary services, your, your inpatients or your floor, uh, non-reimbursable cost centers, which might be entities that are, are off campus or they may be um, all over the place. So the costs get allocated to these cost centers. And really the potential issue here is that we have overhead cost allocations that um, might not make the most sense when you think about them intuitively. Uh, and Blaine, I know you've got a great example of this, and especially as it relates to you know an off-campus department. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of like to look at the B1 stats and and truly focus in on um, does what we're doing in these stats to allocate this overhead cost make sense? And a really easy one to kind of just think about real world example is our cafeteria stat. So you have the cafeteria at the hospital and if there is an off campus facility, um, it's easy to think about like your RHC locations that not might not be very close to your hospital. Are those employees actually going to make the trip over to the hospital to eat in the cafeteria if they're, the distance is too far and that's a no? then there shouldn't be a stat in that line. So if you start thinking about like your easier stats like that, that it is very easy to visualize what's happening there. You can apply that to other stats and kind of do that sniff test. Does it make sense kind of thing to actually have any overhead being allocated into certain lines? So in that example, we wouldn't allocate any cafeteria costs to the RHCs that because it wasn't being utilized by those employees. Another one that I like to point out is anything that's tied to your gross revenue, just to make sure that you're not just using salaries from worksheet A, column one, you're actually incorporating your ASICs reclasses, your A8 adjustments for any offsets, and you're reporting those uh, figures at, you know, essentially your column seven from your worksheet A. Uh, really important to make sure that as you're moving things within the cost report, you track that all the way through so that it ends up matching what it should. Yeah, no, excellent points. So, so spot on and so crucial is to really evaluate these allocations. And, um, you know, another thing too that I, I like to you know tell critical access hospitals is you know you have kind of prescribed overhead cost allocation methodologies that are baked into the cost report, but that doesn't mean that those are set in stone. Um, if you work under um, 
under the guidance that's provided by your Medicare administrative contractor, and you're able to develop a more accurate methodology for allocating overhead, it is possible to adjust some of those. So just something to keep in mind is, you know, um, we can we can also think about how we can adjust these if there's a different way to maybe consider doing that. But you do have to you have to do it in a certain order and at a certain time. Um, so just helpful to be aware of. And, you know, again, reviewing these at least annually is is really the best practice here, at least when we file the cost report and preferably um, throughout the year as we focus on our next best practice, which is tracking our reimbursement throughout the year. So we we um, we have a dilemma with critical access hospitals in the cost report in that being a cost based reimbursed um, entity, your um, estimated rates your your payment that you're going to get from Medicare in a fiscal year is subject to change. It's kind of an ever moving target. And so um, what, what happens throughout the year is you get paid based upon your latest interim rate review. So the Medicare administrative contractor will pay you according to a review that they've done at some point in the past, they're going to carry those rates forward. And then at the end of the year, you're going to submit a cost report for whichever fiscal year you're in and they are going to settle up based upon how your allowable cost actually shakes out. So if you have a, um, a per diem rate of $2,500 in, let's say, fiscal year 23, and there haven't been a significant number of rate reviews, you kind of have that cost report, you had one review, and they're paying you the $2,500. But at the end of the year, you file your cost report and... It's incredible. You've experienced a lot of inflation over the year and your cost per diem goes up to $3,500. What Medicare is going to do is it's going to take the, the difference essentially, and it's a little bit more, there's nuance to this, but at the end of the day, at a high level, they're going to take the difference between those two rates and they're going to pay you the difference. And that applies for your inpatient, that applies on the outpatient side. Um, similar if you have provider-based rural health clinics, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but the, the issue is that that's not consistent amongst payers. And so as we have this, this cost-based reimbursement that continually fluctuates, we need to be considering other payers. And a, a big one that we've talked about, Blaine, is Medicare Advantage because they are um, a significant amount of our payer mix now for a lot of our critical access hospitals and even just hospitals in general. Um, so I know we were talking a little bit about that. I was curious your thoughts. You know, How should we approach um, these other payers? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that it's um, definitely a strategy to, to um, focus in on the rates that you're being paid throughout the year and the timing of that. Um, it's advantageous in the example that you gave to potentially do an interim rate review to get um, more dollars in your per diems so that you can then turn that into the Medicare Advantage plans and they will start paying at that higher rate. Um, you could also see the opposite scenario where you are tracking and your rates are falling um, and they haven't requested an interim rate review yet from your MAC. So you're actually getting a better rate with your MA plans until that interim rate review is requested. Um, the MACs will request those uh, usually at least twice a year. So um, they're trying to settle up. Um, they also do not want to have large receivables or large payables on their side. Um, so we're all kind of trying to play the same game there with that. So there is a strategy um, just surrounding those rates and just monitoring them and making sure that we're trying to get as many dollars as possible for our, our facilities. I love how you put it. It's a strategy, right? You it's funny in healthcare, yep. like you have to have a strategy on how to get paid because that's just, it's so complicated. Absolutely. <laughs> like continual thinking, um, which is, it's just wild. But yeah, and then, you know, at the, at the bare minimum, we just want to make sure we're not surprised at the year end. So even if we are, even if we don't file an interim rate review, um, maybe throughout the fiscal year, which is unlikely, but let's say we do, uh, or, or let's say we don't file an interim rate review, we still want to know what we're anticipating getting paid from our, our payers, right? So Medicare, we do want to be tracking that. And so really a best practice is for us as critical access hospitals to monitor throughout the year. There's a number of different tools available for this. Um, some use interim cost reporting at, at intervals in time throughout the year. Others utilize, you know, um, a reimbursement estimator model, which many 
um, local accounting firms and other consulting firms that prepare cost reports have available, uh, but using something so we have an idea of where we're going to be at year end, because we don't want to be surprised with a significant payable or really a receivable. It's kind of like tax season, you know, you don't want to be getting a huge payable back to the IRS, but you also don't want to be sitting on this significant, you know, refund where you could have been getting that money in throughout the year. So it's, it's really a, a strategy, you know, how do we plan for that? The next best practice we came up with is understanding our service mix. Um, and really in light of the last slide, you know, as we're tracking the settlement, as we're monitoring it throughout the year, service mix really makes a difference. So we, there's a trap um, or maybe not a trap, but there's a potential for um, those who are preparing to get caught up in the, well, this is how things were last year and we're gonna roll forward what happened last year. And you know that applies to mappings, it applies to a number of things, but we really need to understand the operations of our facilities as well. Um, I know Blaine, you've got a lot of firsthand experience with this and how this is impacted. You know, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that you know it, it can just go back to the first example I gave of the EKG line and the um, respiratory clinic and that service mix did change with how we were doing business from year to year. So our rev code allocations needed to be updated there. Um, it's definitely having the right conversations with people that are actually doing the business. If you see fluctuations, large variances and things and understanding what's actually happening within your own facility. Um, I think later on in the presentation, we'll also get into some um, implications with how things can affect you if you're in a system situation with um, related parties and home office. I'll save that for then, but um, that's definitely something else that could impact your um, overall receivable or liability from year to year. So I think it's just kind of keeping your pulse on how your facility is operating in the current year. Um, I think we definitely all saw this when we went through the COVID years, how drastically things were different and changed, um, depending on, you know, what elective items were shut down at that point in time. And we really had to refocus and think that we can't just base things on last year. That's not what, that's not what's happening in our facilities in current year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. We can't just rely on last year. Um, and COVID was a great example of that, um, especially from a from the reimbursement perspective. Um, yeah, so the best practice here, really, when we're tracking our, you know, reimbursement throughout the year, or we're tracking what our settlement might be, we want to be considering changes in service mix, because any change, whether it's at the critical access hospital or potentially at a system level, as Blaine mentions, there can be multiple things that impact how we might look at the current year from a cost reporting perspective. The last one, or the next one we have here is really focused on audit findings. So we have um, cost reports that need to be filed. It's generally five months after your fiscal year end, or if you might have a short period cost report for a number of reasons. Uh, there's even potential to have a little bit of a longer time period. There's a number of ways that that can happen, but generally speaking, you know, you have a a 12 month, a full year cost report, and it's due five months after the fiscal year end. And when you submit this to the Medicare administrative contractor, they take it and they are, they're likely going to analyze that cost report. And they look at a number of different things. And sometimes what happens is your cost report will get kicked out for either an audit or a desk review, which a desk review is just a you know virtual audit. Um, it's not quite as intense uh, as, as an on site audit. But we have all these things occurring and it really, um, opens you up for, you know, potential issues, especially, you know, as, as, as Blaine has mentioned, we're kind of constantly moving in reimbursement. And so, you know, by the time we file one cost report, we might even be looking at, you know, interim for the next uh, cost report period, like there's so much that happens. And so we just need to be conscious that if we do have audits or desk reviews that are occurring, and there are adjustments there that we, we can consider the implications for other cost report years. Um, yeah, I know, Blaine, you have a lot of experience with this. What are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think it's also um, uh, 
worth mentioning um, how far behind some of the MACs are in their audits mm -hmm. currently. So um, several of my facilities are in the late teens. So, you know, 17, potentially 18. And the MACs are trying to catch up on their audit work. Um, so you might be in a desk review or a full audit and have that wrapping up and you get an adjustment report, you have, you know, your two weeks to respond to those adjustments, which I would encourage um, everyone to definitely look at those adjustments and make sure they agree with what's happening um, there, fight anything that you think that you could get um, back for your, your facility. And then once that's done, we've seen the max move right into the next year. So you're not really able to take those findings and those adjustments and apply them to a next year and get an audited, um, and get an amendment out there for what was audited. So what we're what we're suggesting is usually for people to kind of look at their high dollar items and either book liabilities for those, do estimates for the years that you can't get an amendment out right away, and then just incorporate those into any future periods um, as quickly as possible. And hopefully somewhere in between those um, years that still might be outstanding, maybe someone came in and actually realized that there had been a mistake happening and that's corrected on its own. But the auditors do tend to look back at whatever the previous years audit adjustments were and go after that first and roll those forward um, because a lot of the time we are trying to follow to the best of our abilities things that have happened in prior year and then tweak obviously for that but that doesn't always happen so um, the auditors are going to pick up on any big adjustments and push those through to the next year so you just want to not be surprised again that's kind of a theme with all of this Wade I think we yeah. joked about that a little bit that it's all about mitigating those surprises um, to your financials yeah I, it's so true. You know, we should have just had a slide just says that says no surprises. I know there was the no surprises act that was passed and that has to do with, you know, pricing and all that stuff. But really we want that to be the case for our cost reports yeah. as well as reimbursement. We don't want any surprises. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, best practice as Blaine said, you know, we really want to be evaluating, you know, if we have an audit and there are audit adjustments um, that have been proposed and that, ultimately at the end of the day stand, you do have a time period where you can um, go back and forth with the Mac on whether or not you agree with some findings. So, but once those um, audit adjustments are finalized, how do we evaluate other other years? We don't just look at it, you know, just this one year had this finding, where, where else might there be exposure? And, you know, as Blaine said, do we have to book a reserve? Do we have to do anything else to consider that? So again, just looking at that in a, a critical level, evaluating the holistic um, nature of, of, of the cost reports, really. Then the last best practice we have here is focused on cost report reviews. Um, this really stems from just the fact that a cost report is very complex. If you've ever prepared it, I know we have a number of folks who haven't maybe prepared a cost report before or are new to the healthcare industry or new to cost reporting. It is an incredibly complicated document. There are uh, I actually think there's probably thousands of calculations. I might have under, we might have understated it by saying hundreds of calculations, but there are so many calculations that go into it. And we do have, you know, cost report software now that takes care of a lot of the math behind it generally. Um, you know, I think back in back in the day, there were folks who had to prepare cost reports by hand and they had to go through and do all the calculations. And, you know, uh, luckily we don't have to, going to do that anymore in the cost report prep world. But the, the point being, we have some ways to mitigate certain um, errors, but it's still very complex and healthcare is always changing. Um, and, you know, what might be um, considered allowable in one year, it might change based on a number of, of factors. So just really striving to have another set of eyes on the cost report is good practice. And, you know, if we can work in a multi-tiered review, that's, that's the gold standard. But you know, I know, Blaine, we were just talking about it. It's, it might not be realistic for that to always be the case, but it's definitely something to at least think about and maybe strive for is having those yeah. reviews. Yeah, I think it's definitely something that is great to strive for. Um, what I've seen in the past, we, we kind of like to have at least a month there at the end. So, you know, you have five months to actually file your cost report. It's great if you can have all the prep work done at the end of 
at the four month mark or earlier if possible, but the four month mark would be awesome. And then you would have a whole month to do multi-level reviews. And then out of those reviews come findings, um, because honestly you could work on a cost report for years and still find things to tweak and keep doing. Um, so at that point, you know, your four month mark, you have your first review potentially, and then that, that'll have to go back to the prep stage and we'll fix things. And then it'll go through second review. And then there might be more out of that. So you do have to have that buffer time there. And at, at the end to kind of do the multi-tiered reviews and the tweaks before filing. Um, obviously, if you can't fix everything that comes out of these review notes, uh, focus on the high dollar items first, what impacts your settlement the most, um, try to get your settlement as clean as possible. And then at that point, you can amend for other things. Um, you can just do reserves on your books for things if you don't have the luxury of amending and the time. Um, I think it definitely depends on what your role within your organization is and how much else is on your plate because the reimbursement departments usually tend to have a lot of things that flow through them. Yep, they sure do. So yeah, I completely agree. You know, we want to be shooting for this. Um, there are ways that we can you know, triage uh, issues if there are issues prior to filing, but definitely striving to have some sort of review process in place um, is generally a good practice. And this is just a quick summary. If you haven't seen a cost report before, this is the bottom half of your worksheet S, sometimes called the settlement summary, sometimes called the face page of the cost report, and it shows your settlement. Uh, but I like this little tidbit here where it talks about the time to review and complete. You know, cost report they estimated at about 674 hours, um, which is just a lot of time. And I think Blaine and I can both attest to how how much time it takes to prepare a cost report, especially to prepare a cost report well. I think that's the key too. Absolutely. That's about 16 weeks if we're doing about 40 hours a week. So um, that gets you right to your four month mark there. Yep, assuming the 40 hours a week, which is interesting. So, yeah, you know, interesting assumption. Long <laughs> hours usually go into these. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so with that, we're we're gonna move on from the cost report best practices and move into some of the common reimbursement opportunities. Uh, again, these are based on just reviews of, of a number of different cost reports, some of the areas that stand out the most. Um, and it's it's certainly not an exhaustive list. Nothing in this presentation is exhaustive, but I'm trying to look at some of the uh, most meaningful issues that we generally see. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is uh, Medicare bad debts. So if you have traditional Medicare patients who have patient responsibility amounts, deductibles, coinsurance, and they remain unpaid, then they can be added as an allowable cost for Medicare purposes. They, as long as you prepare um, a listing that meets CMS requirements and also have the documentation to support it, you can potentially get 65% of that amount reimbursed through the cost. What does it take for these to, to happen? Well, you have to demonstrate a reasonable collection effort. You have to prove that the debt was uncollectible and claimed as uncollectible. So, um, you know, an issue we see a lot is um, we might have providers that send uh, bad debts out to a collection agency, and they might have a write-off date maybe in their system uh, that it's a date when they sent those to a collection agency or some other date included in there. But really what the, the, the MACs want to know and what CMS wants to know is have all collection efforts ceased on these bad debts. And if they have deemed that, um, yes, those collection efforts have ceased, you have the potential to get reimbursed for these. Um, a big opportunity though, is that it's it's really becoming much more difficult to substantiate and claim these Medicare bad debts and get paid. I mean, gosh, Blaine, there must, you know, has this been a pretty big focus of many audits that you've been a part of? Yeah, it, 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 this has been a huge focus. Um, and I think that the key to this too is, building a partnership with your patient financial services or your revenue cycle side um, so that 
everyone knows what's going to be expected out of these audits. They are usually the um, electronic medical records experts, whatever system you're using. Um, they'll know where to find all of the correct documentation for you. So you definitely want to have a partnership with them. So you're pulling and providing the right items when they the sample is requested for these audits. Um, with that sample comes, you know, if there are findings, that's going to be extrapolated against your entire population in um, you know, nine times out of 10, they're not just going to throw out the one account. They're going to say, if it was an issue here, we're going to extrapolate it against that entire population of your bad debt log. And then another thing that I like to caution everyone on is if you're changing um, electronic medical record systems and you're moving into a new system, what does that mean for everything that's in your old systems in those years, those audit years that are still out there? Make sure that if any of those legacy systems are sunsetting and actually going off of the platform and you won't be, have that um, to pull from anymore, that you have everything you could possibly need, which um, is a little bit of a daunting task. We've definitely had a couple facilities lose some dollars just because we don't have access to that data anymore. So that's a very unfortunate circumstance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If you're claiming something that it's been a long time, then documentation can be difficult. Um, I couldn't yeah. agree more. And then something that came up on our last uh, call actually was um, around the types of bad debts. So not all bad debts are created equal, so to speak. You have different types of bad debts. So you have, um, you know, I guess the two largest categories you could put them into are self-pay, operational. Um, I've heard them termed a number of different things, but they're patients that um, are, are basically responsible for the balance as opposed to dual eligible is what they call them on the cost report, which are your uh, dual eligible beneficiaries, your Medicare and Medicaid uh, eligible, um, eligible patients. And even within those two categories, there's a bunch of nuance there. You also have um, bad debts that are targeted more towards you know, a free care situation. You've got um, maybe bad debts that would qualify as a you know, self-pay, but there's issues um, um, that have occurred within the time that the bad debt has gone to bad debt. And so all, all that to say, you know, we don't need to get into all the details, but there, there is a difference between bad debts. So not all of them are created exactly the same. Um, this is just a, a high level, you know, E-3 part five, this is where you would find your bad debts. And we've got the total bad debts on line 25 and on line 26, we have the allowable which is line 25 multiplied by 65%. We also have the dual eligible that I just mentioned, which is included in your total on line 25, but they haven't break them out on line 27. Um, and then they do a similar uh, thing with your E part B or your outpatient. So you'll have the same process occurring there. You know, if, the, if there is a solution, and I know this isn't a, a silver bullet, but really we just want to make sure we're tracking and substantiating as many of our bad debts as possible with, with accurate documentation. Um, frequently, as Blaine mentioned, you know, frequently audited by Medicare administrative contractors. And so it's so key for us to be taking that seriously. The next one, which we won't spend a ton of time on, uh, is our overhead cost allocations. As we mentioned before, and it, as Blaine gave an excellent example of our cafeteria and how we're allocating those costs, we really just want to make sure that we're applying this, the SNF test to our overhead cost allocations. Do we have uh, cost allocations that make sense? Are there any duplicates? Do we have direct costing and then also getting an overhead allocation for a certain department? Because of our accounting systems, right? Um, there's a number of different risks here. And there's also just the risk that the stat we're using is not accurate. It, it might not truly reflect the usage of whatever overhead department that is. And if there's opportunity to change it, we can absolutely do that. Um, but yeah, this is just, again, I think we've, we've covered this in pretty good detail. Um, so I don't know, Blaine, did you have any other thoughts on this one? Okay. Yeah, I, I would like to point out that um, definitely uh, one that Another one that's kind of a sore point sometimes for folks is square footage. Um, and that can be a really difficult area um, to kind of 
uh, I guess, track for facilities folks and depending on what you're doing, um, really those areas, if you have any movement within your square footage, uh, you know, renovations or um, units shutting down or, or anything like that, those should be prorated throughout the year. And you should be working closely with like your facilities management people and, and those kind of groups to kind of track that. Um, and any additions and things like that definitely need to be changed from year to year. And auditors will focus in on your square footage. If you haven't had changes in years, they don't buy that. If you have too many changes within a year, they also don't buy that. So it's definitely having not only the um, schedules built, but they'll ask for floor plans and, and go down really into some detail to try to make sure that what you're allocating um, for your capital costs in the square footage actually makes sense. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. Excellent point. And again, I can't I keep coming back to we can't just rely on last year. I know that's a common theme too. We've got the no surprises, and then we also just can't rely on the prior year, which you so eloquently put. Um, so yeah, just again reviewing this, let's make sure we have a, a good handle on what our overhead cost allocations are, um, and if there's areas that we need to to consider tweaking. The next one is related to our related party cost allocation. So on the cost report, I'm just going to explain the mechanics of it. And then I'm going to let Blaine kind of chime in on, you know, some of the opportunities here. But on the cost report, we have worksheet A-8-1. And this is where you record your related party expenses. So generally, you'll have um, something on your critical access hospitals books, the accounting records. That's a fee going out to whether it's for a management agreement or whether it's for a, uh, you are part of a corporate system and you have um, you have those dollars going through. You'll have something likely on your books. And then what happens at the year end is if there's a home office cost allocation or if the entity files a related party schedule, you're going to probably get a portion of that related party's cost. And so you do have to, you have to ensure that there's no issues with, um, you know, the reasonableness of those. But uh, we see this a lot with our Cause that are involved in systems. I know, Blaine, you have significant experience here and I'd be curious for your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a, a big portion of this is how is your system um, home office cost report changing? Did you add in another facility? Did your system acquire another facility? If so, everything that's at that integrated overhead costs, like your um, IT functions, some of your accounting functions, potentially, um, all of those kind of integrated system expenses that get trickled down to all of the facilities through the home office cost report, are going to get us each facility will get a smaller piece of the pie if you bring in another facility. So we see this impact critical access facilities um, at a large scale when your system has acquired a larger PPS facility. So that's going to draw more overhead because more resources are going to get pulled into a larger facility than smallers, smaller facilities like a CAW. And so then your CAW at that point um, could have a very different from prior year home office allocation in current year than it did in prior year, much smaller piece. Um, also, what in integrated um, services are actually happening at your home office level? Are there more services happening at your home office level where you charged appropriately for those throughout the year from the corporate accounting side of things? Um, how are those charges coming through? You need to remove all of those charges associated with what the management fees of the integrated service from your worksheet A so that you can pull in the overhead costs that come from the home office cost report and the matching of that can get a little bit muddy it all sounds very simple in theory but it's sometimes difficult based on the way the journal entries were done by your accounting folks to kind of sort through that um, opportunity there is definitely to um, kind of look at the uh, way corporate accounting is charging those things potentially have them all in one cost center that helps um, flow things through to all the entities so you don't miss anything. But when home offices are involved in the A81, auditors do focus in on that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's become a bigger point of scrutiny too, right? With the prevalence of critical access hospitals moving to some sort of system integration, not all of them, but definitely a good, good number of them um, are moving into those types of arrangements. So 
yeah, I completely agree. There's a huge need to be mindful of this. Um, and this just shows the A1 schedule in which you would see those play out um, allowable costs compared to what's actually on your books for an expense. And then the difference winds up as an adjustment. The next one we have is focused on physician standby and on call costs in the emergency room. So at, at the highest level, when we have providers that are being compensated to provide that emergency department coverage, and those providers are not actively seeing patients. The Medicare cost report actually allows that standby time um, as an allowable expense on the cost report. And it's subject to audit, of course, so we need to be mindful of that. But it's really crucial for us to understand how much time our ED providers are actually spending with patients versus just being on call, being on standby, uh, because that can impact our reimbursement. And, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, Blaine, you've experienced similar things in, in prior roles. We've had oftentimes time studies be utilized, which aren't maybe always the most effective way to capture this time accurately. And yeah. To, yeah. 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 I think, I think that also um, with the time studies, you kind of run, run into the issue sometimes that um, the, providers, the physicians, they, they want to be productive. They want to fill their time with productive time. And for them, that usually means patient facing time. Um, that's not always an accurate picture of how reimbursement works and how it works on the cost report. We're actually allowed to keep the dollars that are the availability time or their standby time when they're not patient facing. So a lot of facilities now are going down the route of um, trying to do electronic tracking of this via um, like a Versa badge is a, one of the vendors that does that. That's kind of an electronic tracking within their badges of when they're doing patient facing time and when they're not. And that definitely helps. Uh, one of my facilities was actually implementing this just this past year and got a quote on how much it would cost to have this Versa badge um, technology and software installed and what that cost would look like for the year. And we only had to increase their availability time by 5%. Um, which is not a lot um, through the tracking software to actually pay for this itself. So I think that that's something that um, people can take as like a potential solution to track things in a different way than we've been used to in the past. And um, it's definitely an opportunity. If you can increase that availability time through, you know, obviously uh, measurable and audible audible audit auditable um, yeah. mechanisms then then that's that's definitely going to support you um, when you go through those audits as well so that's something the time studies don't always hold up during audit either um, depending on what's happening there so um, a versa badge or something like that is definitely a better option yeah couldn't agree more uh, and this just shows on our worksheet A2 where we would see that. So we have the total remuneration, um, and then we've got the professional component, which would represent that patient-facing time that would not be allowable on the cost report. And then we've got the provider component, which is the, the true you know, standby time that would be considered allowable. And so the, the goal is to get these as accurate as possible, but oftentimes um, we can see underrepresented provider component amounts. So that obviously impacts your reimbursement. And then we, um, then we have rural health clinic reporting. So we have, um, for many critical access hospitals, they have provider-based rural health clinics or RHCs for short. They're paid based on an all-inclusive rate uh, for qualified services. And what's utilized in developing this, it's a little nuanced, but at the highest level, we do a allowable cost per visit, which is then compared to an all-inclusive rate limit, which it depends on what type of critical access, or I'm sorry, what type of um, RHC you are. It depends on when you were an RHC uh, or when you were officially deemed an RHC. But what the, the opportunity is often is um, we see misallocation of either costs, visits, FTEs, anything on those M series schedules on your critical access hospital cost report, where we really need to be focusing on what are the true RHC services being offered uh, in, in that cost center. So the provider-based rural health clinics are in cost centers, just like all the other um, departments that we mentioned. 
And oftentimes you see just misallocations or, or maybe not matching. So we might have a certain RHC visit count uh, that's accurate, but the expenses might not be accurate because we failed to carve out a portion of the cost that was associated with a provider who went to you know, the hospital to do rounds or something like that. So we really want to make sure that we're capturing all of our RHC costs, our visits, our, our FTE counts. We, we want them all to be matching and focus on RHC services. And I, I, you know, Blaine, I remember we were working on a number of cost reports and even trying to pull reports. They're not always going to get you where you need to be, right? I mean, like this is a challenge. Yeah, some of it's very, very difficult, Wade. Um, I, I definitely remember back to some of the reports that we were kind of trying to use to come up with a visit count, and you'd have physicians that are spending some of their time in the RHC and some of their time also at the hospital. Um, so that becomes challenging when you're looking at where were they, what were they actually doing, um, is everything allocated to the correct lines in the cost report, are we counting a full FTE when we should be counting a partial FTE? They are not spending all of their time in the RHC. Um, that definitely affects your productivity for those physicians and what the goals are that you're supposed to meet. And it's not great to be um, very far below your all-inclusive rate cap, but it's also not great to be super above the all-inclusive rate cap. So it's, it's really meeting that kind of middle ground being as close as possible to that AIR. Yeah, absolutely. Be wary of when you have exact rounded numbers, especially with your FTE counts, because that signals yeah. that you might have, something might not be accurate. Um, but this is your worksheet M-2 where some of it comes together. This doesn't touch on the cost that's on your M-3 schedule, but we'll see here, you know, we have our FTEs. And again, we want to be carving out so that we're capturing the FTEs where the providers were um, that are associated with the RHC, right? We don't want to be counting everything that the provider does. And in many of our rural hospitals, it's very common for providers to not be solely focused in an RHC. They have some other role, some other responsibility. So we need to be making sure we carve that out. And similarly for visits, are the visits we're recording in an appropriate RHC setting? Are they are they qualifying visits, et cetera? So, Absolutely. you know, really just reviewing all this for accuracy is really important. Um, common theme here. Um, and with that, you know, we are all done with the formal presentation here. I know we're a little bit over time and we appreciate you all staying with us here. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat, but if not, you can also feel free to reach out. Um, and I'll put my uh, email in the chat here in case anybody desires to reach out for additional questions and, you know, we can, we can work together, Blaine and I, to, to help you with those questions. Um, but without that, I think we are we are wrapping up the conference for today. We appreciate your time. And if you do have a moment, there will be a polling uh, question. There will be a poll at the end of this um, seminar once you, log, once you log off. If you could please complete that, it really helps us to develop um, better content and uh, make sure we're, we're addressing the questions that are out there. So with that, um, I believe we are all wrapped up and thank you all for joining. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Blaine. Yep. Thanks so much, Blaine and Wade, and thanks for everyone who joined us today. Um, and thank you for your time in uh, giving us your feedback. Have a great afternoon, everyone.